So thanks to the TEDx Dal Yu uh, for inviting me to speak with you today about something I'm very passionate about. So I'm a brain surgeon, a researcher, and a mom. And the two most common statements I get from people when they hear this about me is, one, you don't really look like a neurosurgeon. I'm not really certain what a neurosurgeon's supposed to look like, but if I'm knocking down stereotypes, I think that's a good thing. The other comment I get is, how do you have four kids and still be a neurosurgeon? Um, and I think this is what I'm passionate about. When I was a medical student uh, at UBC, my dean actually told me that women did not go into neurosurgery. That wasn't a career for people that wanted to have families. Um, and so I stand here today for anybody who is interested in a career where they think that they cannot have a family and tell you I have four kids, two of them are who are in the audience, and I think they would agree they enjoy having a mother who's a neurosurgeon. So I'm going to talk about what I do and what some, how I deal with uncertainty and something that I'm very passionate about and I think passion is something you've heard a lot today. Um, uncertainty drives innovation in brain tumors. So these are words that I say every week. Doesn't make me very popular. You have a malignant brain tumor. And I say this much too often. And so when I'm talking about a malignant brain tumor, I'm talking about this. Glioblastoma multiforme, forme, unaffectionately known as GBM. This is the tumor Gord Downey from the Tragically Hip has. So this is an MRI, and that big, white, ugly thing, that's brain cancer. Unfortunately, this is the most common type of brain cancer in adults, and it is uniformly fatal. The average life expectancy is 12 to 14 months. The five-year survival is less than 10%. Uh, so why is that? What is it about this disease that makes it so fatal? Now, this is a CT scan of a body. So unlike other cancers, so if you're thinking about lung cancer, breast cancer, that metastasize or go to other organs in the body, like the heart, the liver, the kidneys, the bones, brain cancer doesn't do that. It does something more insidious. It takes over who you are. It invades your brain like little spider webs weaving tentacles throughout your brain. And I think that's what makes brain cancer so terrifying to people, is unlike other cancers, it can take over who you are and what your soul is. How invasive is it? Walter Dandy was one of the greats of neurosurgery. In the 19, early 1900s, when somebody had a brain cancer on the right side of their brain, he took out the entire right hemisphere and the tumor recurred on the other side. Now, this is a medieval picture of neurosurgeons. I hope we've advanced a bit from these days. You can see the surgeon drilling a hole with a dunce cap on. I think the anesthetist is saying prayers. I'm not sure how that actually works. And I guess that's the nurse with the book hoping to learn something from osmosis. <laughs> I'd like to say we've improved from this. So this is myself and Dr. Pickett, a colleague operating at an operating microscope that magnifies the brain. We have neuronavigation. And that allows us to see where we are in real time in relation to important neurological structures, where the tumor is, where the arteries are, everything that we need to know so we can safely take out a tumor. So I apologize if anybody has an aversion to blood. Don't look at the next slide. So we can see really cool things. So this is a view under the microscope of the internal carotid artery. That's what feeds your brain. The brain, the optic nerve, and the optic chiasm, which help you see, and the third nerve, which actually controls your eye movement. So these are the kind of cool pictures I get to see every day. I think it's pretty awesome. But GBM is more than just an MRI. It is more than just uh, a, a tumor that I cut out. It's more than just a subject of a TEDx talk. It's about people. So this is a picture of a woman in her 20s, in the 1940s. She fought in the Second World War in the Royal Canadian Air Force. She got accepted to university in the 40s at a time when women didn't go to university. She had seven children, over 20 grandchildren, and if she looks somewhat similar to somebody you met on the stage five minutes ago, that would be correct, because this is my grandmother, and she died of a GBM. She had radiation, she had surgery, she had chemotherapy, and eventually, as always is the case, this tumor came back. And herein lies my uncertainty, and this is what I struggle with every day, because at some point, there's no more to say. In medical school, we learn how to fix things. How do you fix blood pressure? How do you fix high cholesterol? How do you fix a ruptured appendix? How do you fix a broken heart, both figuratively and literally? We don't learn what to say when there's nothing left to say. What do you do when you can't fix it? And how do you 
to look at somebody in the eyes and say, there's nothing more I can do. And this is what I'm faced with on a daily basis. And so what I choose to do as a surgeon is look that person straight in the face and say, although I can't help you, I'm working on it. And I might not help you directly, but I'm trying to find an answer. And so that's why I work in the lab. So this is my laboratory at Dalhousie. Um, it's a basic science lab. I apologize because one of my students, Inwa Kim, who's my honor student, she's not in this picture. But basically, in essence, we take brain tumors from the operating room, and then we try to kill them. And we try to find novel ways of making brain tumors uh, or our treatments more effective. So the first project I have is on RNA stress granules. And if you're sitting there looking at the slide going, what's an RNA stress granule? That's exactly the position I was in in 2011 when I was doing my PhD. And I'm walking down the hallway of an unfamiliar developmental biology lab, muttering to myself, what's an RNA stress granule? Because I had an experiment that showed that there was RNA stress granules. And this is where serendipity kind of takes over in your life, because another graduate student came up to me and said, why are you talking about RNA stress granules? That's a developmental thing I'm working on. And that started off a research uh, collaboration that I still do today. So what is a stress granule? Well, tumor cells, some of them live on Earth. So it's a great environment. There's lots of oxygen. It's warm, nice, cozy. These tumor cells are easy to treat. And some tumor cells live on Mars. They live in a very hostile environment. There's no oxygen. There's radiation around. There's chemotherapy. And somehow, these cells have adapted so they can survive this. So they live in this hostile environment easily. In fact, these, tumors are, these tumor cells on Mars are the hardest to kill. And so RNA stress granules are a way of that cell adapting to living to the harsh environment of Mars. So these are what RNA stress granules look like. So the there's four actual brain cancer cells here. The blue stain is the nucleus. And those red dots, those are the RNA stress granules. So I've told you what a stress granule is, but what's RNA? And this is a metaphor I've taken from Steve Jobs. I can't take credit for this. But if you think of DNA as the CEO, so the CEO wants to direct a message to his workers, the protein, right? So how is he going to get that message as a CEO to his workers, the protein? Well, he makes RNA. So RNA is the message that goes from the C. It's the middle manager. It's the message that goes from the DNA to the protein to tell them what to do. And so what a stress granule does is it acts as kind of like the external auditor, uh, auditor of the company. So if you think of these little dots as messages in the cell that are out to the cell to tell them what to do, and you apply a hostile environment, what the, cell, what the stress granule does is says, OK, so these blue messages, they're very important. I want to keep them in my stress granule. I want to save them here so that when I survive this stress, I can make them again, and I can, I can and I reestablish myself. These gray messages here, they're not important. They're garbage. Don't want to make them. Going to degrade them. Don't need them. And these yellow messages, these messages are important now. These are the messages that are going to make you survive and make you live and adapt to this hostile environment. So again, the stress granules are the external auditor, auditor in this company that allow the tumor cells to live in this hostile environment. And so one of the key things my lab tries to do is interfere with this process. So if the cells can't live on Mars, they can't live, and the tumor dies. And so that's a lot of the strategies that we're trying to do in my laboratory. The other, th other strategy we've had is in collaboration with Dr. Jeremy Brown, who's an engineer at Dalhousie, and Dr. Jim Fawcett, who's a developmental biologist. And, and Dr. Jeremy Brown's invented this tiny, tiny little ultrasound probe. And when you apply it into small spaces while you're operating, it uses ultrasonic waves to ablate a brain tumor deep, but leave this, the surrounding tissue uh, un un undisturbed. And so we're testing this ultrasound probe in the OR and, and to see whether or not we can ablate brain tumors with actually having to without having to actually cut into the brain. Um, and so these are just two projects that are going on in my laboratory, but in the research worldwide, there's people using vaccines, using viruses, using electromagnetic waves, all in an ability to try to deal with this devastating tumor. But ultimately, I'd like to acknowledge my patients and their families, because they're the ones that give me the drive and the courage to do what I do. Uh, to see the courage that they face in adversity uh, gives me strength. And I love this quote from Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. So thank you very much for listening to me today.